All right, welcome everybody. This is the meetup for Neptune, which is a drone and aerospace targeted project uh, using OFDM. And this would be five gigahertz. And we've been discussing the requirements and specifications after some, some adjustments and changes on the project. So the, the topics that, that I have to talk about today are, are here on the on the screen. Um, so if you can't see the, the whiteboard, let me know. And let's dive in. So I think the approach we should take is having a library of HDL components. Um, if we break down the block diagram of, of our of our design and then produce components, more focused HDL components or modules uh, in each would have their own repository um, that, that will help us. Right now we have HDL that is probably too monolithic. It's uh, too big uh, and also not efficient in using resources. And this is actually good news because one of the points of this project was to uh, try to use HDL Coder from MATLAB in order to do what they uh, say you can do, which is to take a, a complicated model in Simulink and then convert it to, to HDL. Now that does work and the code is very human readable. Uh, the process is, there's a learning curve to it. Um, and there's lots of interesting things that you have to do to your Simulink model in order to make it a hardware description model rather than just a simulation environment model. Uh, and you can learn a whole lot simulating in, in Simulink. However, I think the the problem that we that we now see is that if you try to do the whole thing in one big bang, that the HDL will not be efficient in using resources on chip and uh, is kind of hard to tease out. Like once you get this large uh, chunk of code, it's uh, some of the decisions that are made that are internal kind of erase your uh, your your blocks. So this is interesting from a computer science perspective, but uh, somewhat of an impediment to get it to actually work over the air. So if we can back up and then reapproach this as uh, maybe more focused HDL library, uh, like Matthew recommended for Opulent Voice, then I think we'll be in good shape. So that's, that's one of the things I wanted to talk about today. Um, another thing is we have a set of requirements that and we would like to turn them into specifications and we'd like those to turn into uh, you know, things that we can implement. Um, and we, we do have a draft set of, of requirements. And I think the question is, do we need anything else at this point? Can we go ahead and start? Are the, the requirements okay? Uh, so with more of a consensus, I think if we had more confidence that we could go ahead and use it or, or if there's any edits that we that we need to, uh, and we've talked about at least one with the bandwidth uh, on Slack, but we need to go ahead and roll that into the actual set of specifications and requirements so we can have more confidence in, in going ahead and and uh, putting things out over the air. And then there are some components from, from Opulent Voice that are highly likely to be useful here. Um, of course, OFDM is a little bit different than, than your traditional stuff. Uh, instead of using an FFT to get on the air, use an IFFT to get on the air. Uh, there's there's some very cool math things that happen with your cyclic prefix. Uh, you know, so so plenty of, of differences. But then again, opulent voice is also turns out uh, different. <laughs> you know, the different sort of way. Minimum shift keying is is a little unusual. So there's got to be some components that we can use from opulent voice. And this goes back to the first item. Because if we approach this with some discipline and have, you know, common sense building blocks, and and if we can avoid the temptation of over abstracting, you know, how to link them all together, that's kind of what we're facing as a challenge over on Opulent Voice with using the reference designs from analog devices is that there is a lot of abstraction and, and mechanism in hooking up their blocks which I'm sure that they're very proud of, and it is useful up to a point. So our goal is to take these building blocks, these, these components, and use them all together to, to implement a design 
that complies with specifications that, that we understand. So our, kind of our task is to, is to do what the reference designs from analog devices do in an open source manner with building blocks, um, but maybe not have the, uh, the same sort of learning curve or I don't really have the right vocabulary for that, but in, in order to make it easier to use for, for people. And then, uh, and then any other business on, on Neptune, I haven't done much except look at the, um, requirements and I've, I've talked with aerospace village, uh, at DEF CON about Neptune. They would love to host a demo. I'm not sure we'll be ready by August for, for anything like what they're wanting, which would be something over the air that would interact with other villages. Um, but that's, that's what I've been, been doing on, on Neptune is mainly trying to figure out. Oh, and, and sorry, I overlooked our, uh, our participation in the, the drone working group for IEEE. And they dove into, to talking about some, uh, you know, requirements and specifications for, for their standard or the standard that they would like to write about frequency spectrum, agile, uh, drone communications and lots of interesting stuff. The thing that that stuck out to me the most was trying to define the terms to try to define uh, frequency agility. Uh, that is exactly what we're trying to do in the dynamic spectrum allocation working group at the FCC. This is a very difficult problem to, to kind of grapple with because if you uh, set yourself up for having infinite, totally total information awareness, complete control over all spectrum, all frequency to be totally agile, then you have required something that honestly cannot be built or would be so incredibly expensive or high end that no no one would implement it. And where do you back off? The, the what both groups have independently done is try to come up with, well, here's some here's a finite list of of places we can go of essentially spectral shapes we can take to avoid interference is the main one for the FCC and for uh, for the drone working group, it seems like they're more interested in maximizing performance of the ad hoc network that the drones make. But I know that in the drone world, it's also avoiding interference as well. So I'll turn it over to 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 uh, to Matthew. Uh, so you have the have the floor, and we could just talk about stuff, uh, or bring up anything that we that that we're not. That wasn't brought up in the agenda, and uh, and make some make some progress. Great, yeah. Um, I think as far as like the um HDL components, I've like for the MSK modem, I've I think that there's like three library components in there. Um, actually four. So I I view like the MSK transmitter, the modulator, the demodulator as two components and then the NCO and the loop filter, the, the PI controller as library components. I think the Costas loop itself is is very much uh, specific to the demodulator. So I, I don't view that as a separate library component. But I, so I think we get four library components out of the MSK development. Um, the, you know, the, the modulator, demodulator, the PI controller and the um, the NCO. Yeah. So, you know, and then as far as I think, um, I had to step away for a moment, but uh, in terms of, you know, release criteria, I think you were mentioned in the agenda last night. Um, you know, I think it would be useful to have a, a code review at some point if, if people were interested in doing that and then maybe you know if there was consensus i don't know if we have an established set of reviewers or if we were to um you know just based on who whoever showed up uh i guess that would be a a, a question but you know once we had a consensus then we we could say yeah things are are ready to publish um but I don't know if that, you know if that should you know probably any major changes. I don't know if we want to do code reviews for every commit, obviously. Um, but maybe if there's new blocks, it's worthwhile. Uh, yes, you know, that's kind of maybe an open question. I mean, we could go either way, I suppose. Um, 
and then I um so I mean I, I, do, is there any further discussion we want to have then the HDL components before we move to the next thing? Yeah, well, yeah. There's a this was a a, a pretty remarkable experience, and and I I, I would I, I recommend like. I would recommend the process, but maybe not the product. Um, the there's a lot of really interesting things going on with with code generation from based on models, and and there's multiple ways to do it within the MATLAB Simulink sort of sort of tool flow. That's mm -hmm. that's also done with Xilinx with HLS, um, you know, with the high high level. Uh, synthesis i think high level language synthesis that they they do so turning either c code into you know hdl in this case it's uh matlab functions can also be simulink blocks which is a real powerful way to get something done in simulation and those are fair game too so i have a, a book that ha it's lte in matlab and it is a really good book it helped me out tremendously trying to just learn about ofdm um and what it does is it it puts it all into MATLAB functions. All of those functions can then be packaged up in a Simulink block, and then you have a working LTE uh, transmitter and receiver. And LTE is complicated, you know. It, it's complicated. There's an awful lot of acronyms, and it's like they ran out of all the three-letter acronyms and went to the four-letter acronyms, and then they ran out of four-letter acronyms and went to five-letter acronyms, and it's acronyms all the way down. And there's a lot of interaction and and cool stuff that happens with like essentially a session layer because subscribers. So anytime that you have to sell and monitor um, access to spectrum, then you this stuff ends up in your protocol. So have it, you know, you do all that. And you can tell what MATLAB is wanting to help people that have these sorts of requirements and and have these sorts of protocols, and that you can pull off creating HDL that implements these fairly complex protocols. When when we approach it, we don't have a lot of that baggage. We can actually do, we can we can pick up different baggage. We can, um, you know, we could abuse some of these protocols in, in a different way. So, you know, when you when you when you follow through in the promise of of HDL coder and try to do like a big bang HDL production on the end, it, it sort of has that that vibe of like, oh, it's um uh, it's it's all smeared together. Here you go. It works. It's readable, but but you can tell that like this would have to be somebody's full time job in order to to plow into and maintain. If we if we took that code, we could probably force it to work. But forcing it to work means uh, dealing with the fact that it is not a, doesn't efficiently use the FPGA resources like I expected. Some of the things that that we've talked about on Slack are mentioned like. Is it properly using the actual architecture that you've targeted? And in the HDL coder, you actually tell it what architecture. So my assumption was that it would figure it out and know, like, oh, this needs to be off in BRAM or, you know, oh, if you just did this slight change, then it drops the use of loots by 40% or whatever. But it doesn't. Um, and I think that is is probably too much work. So it's too much work to like big bang a, a design and then make it fit. And that the approach of of say, you know, if we have something that's a that's a component a, and and we're we're going to do a code review for for a uh, for a HDL component for a repo, like a focused repo, yeah, we could go over to HDL coder while we have access to it and then run that particular function. And then we have something to compare to. That adds to our you know our 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 confidence that that the the one that we've written that we're reviewing is is good and who knows i mean we might find some some cool things in the in the implementation but in order to get it on the air i think i don't know i, I now no longer think that this is this is probably this is the best path i i, I could see that there's tremendous advantages to using like hdl coder and automated hdl production but you really have to use it correctly and the initial approach of like having the entire design the whole transmitter and do a, you know we divided it up into three sections because it seemed like you could chop it off it and you in order for hdl coder to work the input and output have to be the same clock so once you cross over into a different clock domain you you need to cut it there you need to just divide your design there and then 
start over. So we did that. And there's like three different obvious chunks. And those chunks are still kind of too big. They're still not tractable for, uh, I think, a volunteer open source team. And they barely look tractable for, for most companies, really. So, so I think we've done like our due diligence in exploring this tool and figuring out if it will work for us and, you know, dividing and conquering and having a more atomic approach, sort of like GNU Radio does. The sort of the GNU Radio mindset is a block needs to do one thing and do it really well. It's supposed to be as atomic as possible. That's the guidance that you get when you are working with it or putting together flow graphs. So adopting that has wisdom. So that's that's kind of what I see so far from from efforts to to get Neptune to work with HDL Coder and more of a big bang uh, approach. It's it's like it almost works, but not not exactly. Yeah. Um, and the time that is, would be required to sort through the three blocks of code, um, which is published, we we went ahead and published it. And it's like, well, <laughs> you know, once once you kind of smear everything together in a big block of code, now you're not really dealing with things that you understand. You're dealing with whatever the code, ba the, whatever the tool gave you. So, and it makes some shortcuts that are interesting and then doesn't make shortcuts that you expect. So you know, you as a human are having to adapt to what a computer has done. And from what Paul tells me, that's a golden rule. <laughs> the, the You're never supposed to wait for the computer. The computer is, <laughs> you know, so it's kind of like uh, giving a an automated process too much um, control over the authorship of HDL, which is already hard enough to begin with. So. So lots of it, it, lots of computer science. It's lots of computer sciencey stuff going on that we can see, um, you know, and not delivering like it didn't stick the landing. You still have lots of work to do when you get this code base if you do the big bang approach, which yeah. uh, you know not not recommended. Yeah, I mean, you know, my experience yeah, has always been, and it's been really successful for you know for my my uh, day job over many decades now it is just divide down and uh you know the design to the the component pieces and implement those in in, H, in hdl and make sure they work right and then build up the system and it, it's provided to i mean it's it's a lot of work initially compared to the promise of like an hdl coder but on the other hand you end up with a library of stuff that's in some ways similar to HDL Coder, Coder's library, but it's it's your library. You know how it works. You know what to expect. You know where its its weaknesses are. And um, but the other thing then is, you know, even even RTL is imperfect. An HDL language is imperfect going to an FPGA or even an ASIC, in that. You know, the synthesis tool doesn't always do what you want. The placement tool doesn't always do what you want. And, you know, I'm in the, in a position where I, I, I hand optimize things. I'll instantiate FPGA com, uh, library cells to get to get to get what I the results I need. Um, so, I mean, I can't even rely on RTL necessarily to give me the results that that I'm looking for. Um, so if, if when you abstract it one more level to an HDL coder, you know, you, you you kind of just have to live with what you get. And if it, what you get's not meeting your requirements, then yeah, I think, you, have, you know, it's, it would be really hard to go in and fix that code. I, I It's not a job I would want. Um, so you, you kind of end up having to go implement at least the pieces that, that it what didn't do well or didn't get you then what you needed and implement those anyway. So you know, it's, it's a bit of a double-edged sword or, you know, a toss up, but in the end, you know, I keep finding that to get the results I'm looking for, you know, I, I have to, it has to be H or, uh, you know, an RTL implementation. And, uh, and even then sometimes, like I said, I have to instantiate things that, that the tool won't do for me that I know need to be done. I mean, I'm, this has been the case. I used to, you know, in the early 90s, uh, I was at TRW, and 
doing ASICs work with Synopsys and even Synopsys wouldn't at the time, maybe it's better now, I would hope. <laughs> But, you know, it, it, <laughs> there were like eight to one muxes in the in the cell library and it, and I needed one and synopsis wouldn't do it. Right. So I had to, I had to instantiate, you know, the actual cell library to get what I needed. So, yeah, I, I so I, I think, you know, the, these abstractions are really attractive. They're they're exciting because you're like, oh, I can put the system together and I don't have to go do, you know, this these years of work. But in the end it's going to be years of work if you're doing a really complicated system. Yeah. You know, I mean, I worked at Nokia for a while and, you know, I don't remember exactly what we thought, but I mean, it was like from concept to product was five years. And it's been that my experience over several products of my career that, that it's, it's a multi-year effort to bring something that's productized and, and ready to, to go into production. Yeah. I completely, I strongly concur. And that was that was a problem we actually ran into when we tried to get funding from um, from ARDC was that they thought that we would be done in a year with this proposal for the for the transponder for Hyferia, and you know it was very clearly a, a five year plan uh, that that Wally came up with and and laid out, and you know working at working in cellular telephony to to make make chips and phones it's multiple years it's it's uh it's quite a while mm -hmm. yeah so I, and another thing i strongly agree with is is when you when you have a code base and you have to work on it or or integrate either implement finish whatever word you want to use if you're if you're working if you come in to a team or come in to work with somebody and it's there's a bunch of stuff already written so you have to then go read code so you have to read code to come up to speed to figure it out with a person or a team, you know, even if it's a fractured team, if people have gone off to other things or not accessible anymore at all, at least you have some humans to talk to, to, to get answers on what, what were you thinking or, <laughs> or wow, that was great, you know, and all the, all in between, but look with computer generated code, you don't have anybody to interrogate and with a, this is a commercial product that we're using and relying upon. So the it's obvious a lot of care and thought went into figuring out how to turn this block in Simulink into this bunch of HDL code. It's most of it is very good when you take it item by item, you know. And since that's you know, but you can't ask it. You can't ask Simulink, you know, or HDL code or anything. So that's kind of a, a big difference. And I think we're seeing this across the board with copilot or any sort of ai assist is that you can't interrogate it on how it came to think these things that it's suggesting to you so it's not really the sort of conversation that you would have with a with a human author where you can collaborate with somebody to stick the landing on their code base or if you have to come in and and you have to do sustaining engineering on a project and then a, a new you know, a new customer comes along and you have to make changes, at least you can ask a person and they will speak to you differently than a completely silent, you know, tool will. So that, that to me, that stands out to be a big difference that a lot of us are going to have to confront or are already confronting uh, with a lot more automation. And that's all AI and ML is, is automation. And, you know, this isn't necessarily an AI ML sort of situation, but it is an automated code generation and there's there's no author really um so i think we should probably use it to its strength and not to its advertised strength so i think right. we could see that the strength is there that it produces good code for particular chunks so ed recommended breaking it down and actually putting it through its paces and like so we here's the common you know computer science um digital, you know, hardware HDL stuff. So, you know, all of computer science, take that and then say, okay, here's the things that HDL really cares about. These are the atomic functions that, H that HDL cares about, unrolling loops or, you know, whatever. He had a long list. And he was like, okay, so now let's focus on writing things that really test HDL coder and look at what it produces and then publish all of those, you know, as a table or a database. So I was like, yes, that sounds good. That sounds useful because now we're using it for its strength and and not maybe not the way that they market HDL coder. They really want you to use it in the way that we tried 
and we did. And, you know, if I had, if we had 50 people all working on it, I suppose that maybe they could, they could do that. But, you know, the real strength of this is that there's quality automated generated code that we can start with that, that might help. Um, and it, and I think that that would that would both inform and, and, um, and increase our, our library, um, you know, but, but like at, at this point, I think we can make a call, like trying to do a big bang approach, doing a complicated, a fairly complex Simulink model. And honestly, I mean, it's, there's, I've seen more complicated stuff than what we've done, but it is kind of a, 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 a big model, you know, oh, here's, you know, it sends out three preambles and, you know, now you switch to data and you're doing OFDM and you're doing a particular type of OFDM, all of that's pretty complicated. And when it produces code, it's like, I don't know if we, if this is really tractable and if it doesn't really gel well, it, I mean, so HDL coder will take in the reference design. It knows about analog devices. It knows about which target device you're using. It knows which version of Vivado you're using. It should already optimize all of the things that we already care about. That is the big win to me. And it didn't really deliver that. So it's still a very, um, it's very profligate. <laughs> it just spreads out, it, you know, and the 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 limitations on the, the version of Avato are pretty significant because it's it lags significantly. Like we're using 2022.2, it wants 2019 for reference designs. And I'm like, that's, and there's some things that you give up when you go from 2019, which was a banner year for reference designs. You know, that was, that is a significant code base. And then, you know, there's some updates, some updates, and 2022 is a big deal too. But like, why is it three, four years, five years behind? Um, so the the version skew, that's another big challenge for for using these tools. So I think we should use it where it's strong to throw off these smaller atomic focused functions that we keep. And we say, okay, here you go. Here's a IFFT, here's an FFT, here's an NCO, here's a whatever. And then anything that we're interested in, we we have put that as part of a repo. It's like, okay, if, if anything good from that, if it works better than what we can handwrite, then great, we can use it. That's that's legal and free. It worked, you know, that's the code that HDL Coder produces is yours. You own it, you can publish it, you can run with it. We're free and clear to use it. That's a big advantage. But you know, now we can we can say, okay, here's a here's a competing, you know, if you're gonna do a code review, here's a competing implementation, you balance it out, you decide what you what you want to adopt. Um, you know, and that with, in other words, is it a change in the way that we're using HDL coder and that's totally fine. Yeah, I I you know, I'm I'm not as familiar with HDL coder itself, but I mean I think there's a huge advantage in the tools like Simulink and and GNU Radio in that you, if you use them as prototyping platforms to help understand the system that you're wanting to implement, but they're not, you know, but translation from there to an RTL, you know, I, I think is problematic. But, you know, like yeah. you said, like maybe there's benefits in individual blocks that you don't have to code those up. But, you know, even, even still, what the other thing that concerns me then is you know, especially if you just take reference designs and here's a whole LTE, the, there's a certain amount of system engineering and system analysis that's missing from that. That right. is cool. Like, you know, for example, we this modem I have, or I've been working on for a long time. We had a customer one time and they're like, oh, we're taking bid errors twice a day. But the rest of the day, everything's fine. And, you know, we had to go look at it and look at it. And it turns out it was a diurnal heating and cooling issue. So when the when the product heated up in the middle in the morning, it took a blip of errors, and when the product was cooling down in the evening, it took a blip of errors. And what what happened was they had they were having a phase jump in their LO in the radio, and and so now we're like, well, we have to fix this in the modem, right? And so we had to add pilots um, into our modem to to track that, right? This is the kind of stuff that Simulink and GNU Radio will never be able to identify. And 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 if you had to go retrofit a design to solve that kind of problem, it's going to be potentially much more difficult if you're starting in that environment. Um, 
Yeah, anyway. I mean, they uh, GNU Radio and both both GNU Radio and something like they do have these the idea of having a channel model in there. Like, right, so you can, can put an impediment in there, but like it's right. still it's all like a stick figure, really, rather than dealing with the actual the actual real environment, an actual yeah. you know an actual channel in, in radio is messy and hard and bizarre stuff happens all the time. Right. So and the, these aren't even channel effects, right? I mean, right, I had, right. Um, yeah, it's bigger than that. It's room. like this is a temperature. You know, and there, I, don't, I don't know. Maybe somebody can correct me if I'm wrong, but I don't even know of any way to put in uh, temperature effects into GNU Radio. There's just not a plane that it that it grapples with. Well, I mean, you could, you know, if you could make the LO jump, you could maybe see it. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> But the other thing, then we had another customer whose radios were subject to microphonics. You'd hit the pole. Oh no! It was, right? You're like, <laughs> oh no! So I mean, so I'm just saying, you know, this is all well, you know, it just there's there's something. My fear is, and and my, this is my fear for a long time, out of experience, even the stuff that I do in my day job is like, you know, I used to argue with my with my boss who was the president of the company. I yelled at him at times because they're like, he just wants things to be a certain way and you're like look if you do that like he wants to release fpgas that aren't quite meeting timing i'm like look you're gonna have problems in the field and we're not and you're gonna look at it and go have no idea what that problem's coming from and it's gonna be these weird things or it's gonna be bit errors at odd times and it's just it's gonna be take so much time and effort to diagnose you don't you don't want to do that you don't want to put yourself in that position but i mean so i mean there's just certain things that born out of experience that that you know i worry about it, it, and you know so when we when when we don't have enough of the underlying understanding of the system to go oh this effect is maybe causing this problem or be able to reason about the system at a very deep level then when things come up you're 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 not going to be able to address them effectively and you know, so I fear only that that when you abstract too much, again, we've been talking a lot about abstraction, that 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 deep understanding of the system uh, gets lost a little bit or can get lost. Um, so that's just kind of another thought. So then then then. But I mean, again, these tools, they I think they have a place. I mean, for example, my modem that I work on, we've had a C++ simulation on that modem since day one. And we used to put this modem in ASICs. And so, I mean, the idea it was the C++ was really our golden code base, even more than the RTL. Because we would not, we could run the C++ for days and get, you know, minutes of wall clock time on the simulation. But if we were to only run the RTL, we'd be getting at best seconds of wall clock time in the simulation. So the C, so we would, the C++ was the golden and we would generate vectors and we would run those vectors against our RTL and the RTL had to bit for bit match the C++ vectors. And that, that's been our, you know, uh, methodology for 30 years. And it's borne out really well. Every single ASIC that I've participated in has been a first pass success functionally for, with this approach. They, there's always some little niggling thing that we have to do a respin, but, but the functional the the modem always worked for the first time and we never had to respin due to a modem issue um now we're not talking asics here so the the investment the the pain of of getting something wrong isn't isn't to that level but on the other hand you know if you have a schedule if you have real you know customers expecting something you know that 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 can still be painful if you have to go dig through and, and figure something out that was unexpected. So, you know, I guess, you know, these high level implementations have a neat purpose. They're good for prototyping. They're good for understanding the system to some degree and kind of verifying how we might do things. Like if we do something new or if we want to try and do something new, we put it into C++ simulation and run it. So yeah. I mean, the view you know the 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 simulink or GNU radio is as that you know making that that high level implementation to simulate and and see how the system is going to work better yeah uh, as a as a prototyping tool i think these are these are best in class i mean i would not be able to understand minimum shift keying without seeing 
the what was happening in Simulink when I was like, oh, I get it. Especially the, you know, you convert it to, to sinusoids and you add the sinusoids together. And after staring at it for a while, I'm like, oh, that's really quite, that's amazing. Mm -hmm. You know, and then on the demodulator side, that block diagram for the Massey Hodgart, it was like, okay, it's just a bunch of blocks and I'm not even sure what they're supposed to be doing. So, and then with your input and explanation <laughs> and then, you know, all these steps, it's like, all of a sudden it's like, oh, okay. So you don't really get that by looking, or I don't, at least, I don't get that by looking at the VHDL code. Like no. this, this, that, that's not going to happen for me. I'm sure there's some unicorns out there that this is how they understand the system stuff or how it really works but for me like the system level or the simulation with visualizations it's very visual learner and with all this stuff you know looking at the waveforms that's how it happens that's how it happened with ofdm seeing this walked through in some books and some you know and actually making it happen in simulink and making it show me i'm like oh that now i get it okay that's because some of the naming conventions in OFDM, I'm like, I wouldn't have maybe said called it that because it's a little confusing, you know. But but now it's 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 settling in and, and makes sense, you know. And and that's that's a those are good things that that we use and we need to use those. We need to use it to its strength and not expect it to to also do dishes and fill the fridge and you know you come around with a stick and a spoon or something. It's you know, it, expecting it to do the things it was it's advertised to do. You know, and he, you know, so so commercial companies are guilty of this because they would really like for you to buy the product, even if you don't really need it, and even if you're going to be trying to use it for something that maybe your particular project is not appropriate. There's got to be some projects out there that are correctly abstracted to the level to where a Big Bang HDL coder product is exactly what they need. I'm sure that they exist. You know, but even GNU Radio is guilty of trying to um, uh, sell it as a as an industry as industry ready. You know, and this was a big discussion in 2017, 2018 at at GNU Radio conference where they were the keynote address and a lot of the talks were like how we're industry ready and we've transitioned from being just a prototyping tool to where we can deliver actual results in industry. This caused a big amount of um, uh, either it pushed for that from from the core dev team and then the rest of the community is like i'm not sure that you understand what industry ready means mm -hmm. and we need to we, we need to be what we are like we're the best prototyping tool out there there isn't anybody even really close and so that was a thing that the that GNU radio went through it took a couple of years to kind of flush this out and some rejection and some you know to to figure out that yes it's a prototyping tool and not quote unquote industry ready because it's very tempting to do this. Like, I think we've seen, we can see the temptation all around us. And, and if we kind of resist the temptation and, and, and be a little bit disciplined, I think that we'll be able to avoid over abstraction uh, with, with what we do. I guess this relates also to like the, what's happened over the past couple of days on Opulent Voice, like, because you brought up like, oh, you know, using the project mode in Vivado versus non-project mode and, if we can pull it off in project mode, then it's a lot more accessible to people. There's a lot of people that will use projects from Vivado and will and know how to deal with a design in project mode. And they're like, not really sure how to deal with it in non-project mode because it feels like it's uh, random blocks banging together. Now that's not a necessarily fair uh, take, you know, but it's pretty widespread. Anybody that's approaching FPGA design or trying to learn or trying to get get go up on the learning curve almost invariably gets directed off to a project, to project management. If they're using Vivado, it's to approach it as a project because then you can give a pedagogical lecture to somebody that's like, okay, so click Vivado, you know, new project, you know, and that's how it always starts. And the this whole vast powerhouse of tackle and and building things and and actually controlling it is abstracted from you by project mode. So I mean, we so we have we could see this. It's 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 abstractions all the way down. So it, it's just been very very revealing that you know if we can get um, opulent voice done better, faster, stronger, smarter by just cutting out 
maybe project mode in Vivado, okay, good. But you know, then we have to also balance that against it's going to leave out a lot of people that that they only ever approach Vivado from project mode, um, and or yeah. then they have to they have to then know a lot more. They have to be I mean, more comfortable. A good balance there. I mean, I think there can be a balance. I mean, yeah, I certainly. Yeah, understand. there can. This is definitely an area where it's really, you're really not that far away. If you're used to project mode in Vivado, you're not that far away from being able to manage it with with scripts, with Tekel, with, with actually, because all of the stuff in Vivado is translated to Tekel commands. Everything that you do in the GUI, everything is a Tekel command, and it's, and it's presented to you in the Tekel console. And a lot of people never look at that. But if you do use Favato and you only use the GUI, go check out the Tekel command. It's a console because there it all is. And then you own it. And and you, there's a lot more flexibility and more power that you have when you address it with just these commands. Yeah. So you know, yeah, a lot sure. of people never look at it. They never, they don't even know, you right. know. Yeah, it's gonna say, you know, it, you know, the bigger impediment in, in Opulent Voice you know that we do project mode or non-project mode i mean i think we've been doing both i think every was you know using project mode when he did his build and and was able to get a, a bit stream this morning or this evening for him uh versus you know i i focused on the non-project mode but you know the bigger impediment well i mean there's a you know here like all the adi stuff is all tickle it's all scripted mm -hmm. it's, but it's it's in the scripting, it's project mode versus um, a lot of it versus non-project mode. So you know, th there's th they're not mutually exclusive. I think you know, right, terms, that's I true. Think, they're not mutually exclusive, which is something that that is usually not true. But it is true about about this. Yeah, but the the and I think that's ex actually ex exactly right. That to me, from what I've been seeing, the bigger impediment abstraction wise. For opulent voice has been the adi stuff yeah and, and and trying to use what adi has done and it's really attractive and it's really neat because you have all these you know i should just be able to do this this and this and this and everything's going to work but then there's all these mysteries that we're trying to unravel that that you know we haven't gotten to the bottom of and and it's very frustrating <laughs> to to say that this is hooked up and it's the same thing as everything else but it's it's not working and not having a good way to resolve that. Yeah, I think you 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 summed it up really well. Like if they productized it, <laughs> you know, they did all this work, which is a lot of work to to make these designs happen with a make file with all this mechanism and then they don't document it and they won't tell you things and they really won't tell you things and, and they get very touchy about it, but they want you to use it. They expect you to use it without revealing what's behind the scenes. And it's, I, I have nothing but empathy here because uh, I can see their conundrum, but like, it's not useful. <laughs> it's not as useful as it could be. It's still useful. It's still, we're still getting, getting forward, but it's like, it could be so much better. And I think that's the most painful thing for me is that it could be, I see the potential. I I, I actually, yeah, you know, a soft heart wants to help them, but they're, it's like it's it, they're unhelpable. You know that they, they've they've chosen this path. You know, and it, it, so it, you it, know it, you brought up you brought up Everest, and I apologize to Everest. I have not let you get a word in edgewise, so I'm I'm gonna invite you to to say and to contribute and to comment on anything that we have. Um, so so I think sorry. My apologies to, to Matthew for cutting you off there, um, but I, I'm going to let Everest uh, uh, catch up here and, and be able to, to to say whatever he wants to talk about. Yeah, okay. <clears throat> I don't know if you hear me. Yes, yes, and welcome. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I'm there more to, uh, <clears throat> uh, to get all your very interesting information and conclusion about uh, what is, uh, well, how we can use uh, separate FPG components, uh, what is the magic tool chain, etc. This is very, very interesting. As uh, soon as, uh, well, I tried as a 
um, uh, very new by in FPGA, only some uh, uh, trying to uh, to uh, glue uh, all the uh, individual components uh, in a design. I, I am not able to uh, uh, to write some VHDL, for example. Uh, but uh, I try to uh, find a way to easily integrate some components. So I think that uh, the Machu, uh, Machu proposal about having uh, some repository with some uh, very basic components we can uh, uh, connect, uh, which would be very helpful. Um, I already uh, works with some very basic components uh, written by OSKIMP. Uh, it's a French uh, university. Um, it is very uh, easy to use, which means that it's uh, RTL. Um, uh, you have some uh, register. I, I can map it easily uh, under Linux. And um, and provide some setting and uh, having some status. It, uh, that's for me uh, the best uh, to have very some well some very mm, yeah bas basic component like NCO or uh, some yeah very basic component. I I look also at um, uh, uh, Pavel work uh, for uh, Red Pitaya, for example, which. Yeah, who, uh, who a, a lot of uh, yeah separate components, uh, SDR components, which could be very useful for a, lo a lot of design. Um, and I doped about the uh, the HDL caller from uh, Simoning, uh, from um, oh, sorry, uh, well the the HDL caller which is like GNU Radio, as you say. Uh, which could be useful for prototyping, but uh, not so not so easy to uh, to use um, uh, in real life. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah, um, about the mm, yeah the the project and the non project uh, Vivado. Um, well, the, the way I, I work, which is uh, just a, a very new by uh, way, surely. Uh, usually I, I use Tickle. And if, uh, well, I can, I can use the GUI from Vivado uh, just to, uh, okay, to uh, help me um, uh, validating uh, my, all my, um, uh, my wires. But as soon as I have done that, after that, I, I, I do all that in Tickle, which means that now, and uh, on the last uh, open um, uh, building firmware, uh, there is no, uh, well, you, you, you don't need uh, the Vivalo GUI at all. So all is uh, now automatic. Uh, maybe there, uh, they, uh, I correct some uh, the the, uh, IP uh, the from the MSK top, which uh, generates the component.xml directly. So all all is okay now. I hope. Uh, well, that's just my uh, uh, new buy opinion about all that. But I'm very interesting in uh, speaking with uh, uh, with people like you. Thank you very much. No, thank you. Um, you're you're a huge, uh, hugely appreciated, Evariste, and thank you very much for for all your help and your point of view. Um, and thank you the most of all for your time because time can't be uh, replaced. So once you once you spend time on something, that's it. So it's invaluable to me, and I appreciate your attention here. I thought it was really interesting the way that you phrased that because that's. Generally, how I use Vivado is I use the the graphical user interface or the GUI from Vivado uh, to look at the block diagram because as a visual learner, I like I need to see that the block is in there and I need to see where it's connected 
and I need to see the design, like how they laid it out and stuff. And that's, that's great. So you generate the block diagram. And then if everything else is in code, then I'm a lot happier. Um, some people use the GUI for everything, like, and they edit inside of Avato. And that's fine, you know, but there's a lot of stuff that, that you can't do in Vivado. So I have a question about about the component XML, because I'm now educated on what component XML does. Do you generate it with the IP Packager tool, or do you generate it at the command line somehow? Yeah, it's a Mac, it's a Mac file. So uh, it is uh, generated at the same time as the, as the uh, the synthesis of the of the RTL component MSK top. Um, just let me see. So you, you uh, don't, don't do, you, do you, so you don't do it from the the graphical user interface. No, 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 no. It's uh, th there is two things. There is a make file and a tickle, as I remember. Yes, there's uh, the make file, uh, which is pretty simple. You're talking yeah. about the the make file and the block. Yeah, the make yeah, file. Yeah, yeah, for the block. Yeah, it, it's pretty simple. That's not too bad. Yeah. And then the tackle file is some um, attention, but, but but when you generate yeah. the component XML, you're not using the the GUI. No, 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 no. It is uh, or it is uh, built at the same time with uh, the make file and the and the ticker. So th there is no need of uh, of the GUI, but. Huh. Okay. Because I've been hand editing all of that, and the the component XML I use the uh, package IP inside of Vivado. Yeah, yeah. I I see that on the um, on the on the on your documentation and. Uh... Yeah. No. I, I if you may I don't know how to do it the way that you're doing it. That's that's cool. I think it would be more. I think it probably produce something. Maybe it's producing something better because the my component XML from the IP packager seems to be very fluffy. It's a very large file, but the other component XML files seem to be smaller and more focused. Okay. Um, yeah, so I had small uh, changes, which mean that uh, we need to, uh, in the, the, the general make file, on the top file, uh, I need to uh, build this one, well, this uh, MSK top, and something like that. That's it's it's a um, few um, uh, few mod modification which uh, which now uh, seems to work. And the other thing is that uh, uh, right now you use the MSK top inside the library folder of uh, AD, mm -hmm. and I think that it could be possible not to use that. As I remember. Um, on the on the GVBS two caller, it is outside. Yeah, and, and it, it is. Has, uh... It is. So it's, it's outside of the coder. It was brought in as yeah. like add yeah. files, and there's a whole other script. This caused a lot of a lot of pain because it's yeah. different. It's different than in than the ADI. So it, this is this is a very good question. You've brought up a very very important point, and if you if you want to be part of the reference design, which does a lot of amazing things and is easy to then use in like Petal Linux or in firmware, then you really will reduce your pain if you look exactly like another ADI block. If you do exactly what they do, if you if you you're the wolf in sheep's clothing, you you know you go along with the herd. Um, but as we found, we don't know all the secret handshakes. We don't know the secret passwords, all of them. So we can get by if we squeak through. And you found out how, like uh, the MSK top, you know, it it started working yesterday. Um, or we can do what DVB S2 encoder did and just be totally different and be outside. And and, and we had to use, um, I think, uh, Git, like Git components or, you know, sub modules uh, and add files and a lot of extra mechanism. But it stands out like a sore thumb. Like you have to know then how to do that. You have to, and it has to be written down. Yeah. You know, careful. Like we have to actually explain it to somebody that knows nothing about this. You want to use your IP in the reference design? 
you want it to be an external thing, like like DVBS2 did, then here's how you do it. And that's not documented very well. So if you don't yeah. already know, then you're totally hosed. So you can be partially hosed by ADI yeah, I, or totally. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, so if yeah, we can I, we can write this down, if we can make a guide, I, like here's how you get your RTL into the design externally, then yeah, yeah. we would be in good shape. We would be very yeah, happy. I, I can try because um, uh, integrated uh, the fold in, into the ADI folder, which means uh, you 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 need to uh, well for, for um, uh, Git repository you need uh, mm -hmm. to have uh, another branch and uh, it's more easy to have a separate Git and have a Git sub module yeah. in order to have uh, your HDL uh, extra components uh, which is not in the reference design but you you don't touch anything. Uh, from uh, from yeah. the ADI, even they up, um, even uh, they uh, they have some new commits on their design, which means that uh, we are separate from them, and it's easier to maintain. I think. Yeah, it it, it has a lot of promise. Um, I think the 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 thing that we would need is to actually write down. The process like why are these tackle commands there why is this here yeah you because know, it actually goes into the board tackle script at least it did for the 9371 like it goes in there and there's a bunch of weird commands that look different than anything else and then the the you you have to get your code into the uh, uh the the tree like and and a sub module is the best way to do it but actually writing it down for someone who has no idea what is going on is the is the last thing. That's the one thing that we need. That's the last component that we're missing is to to be able to explain what's going on okay. to somebody that does not know in advance. Like they're they're familiar with ADI reference designs. They know that they have they have this code base that works. They've simulated it and synthesized it. It works. They're happy with it. They want to put it in, in between two other blocks in the design, in the reference design. So what do they do? And yeah. and that's what we're missing is the instructions on how to cut their block in. Yeah. And the, the problem with the ADI uh, reference design is, <laughs> is the clock, which yeah. means that I, I have... Uh, some uh, high headache with uh, integrate. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Uh, first, the, the DVBS two, and yeah. uh, uh, and we have yeah, and and after that, I more uh, learn about how they how they use clock, and uh, why sometimes they want uh, uh, a common clock between the uh, for the S, the S axis and the S axis. So, so mm, it's, well, yeah, uh, maybe I have to document some uh, what I, why, what I try to learn uh, from the AD uh, reference. Okay, that would be very helpful to, yeah. to know, like, you know, because we can see that the DVBS2 encoder insertion worked. But yeah. like people were asking like, well, okay, so if I have, if, and you know, like for example, the um, Ken who's working on the polyphase uh, filter uh, channelizer tried to use, cause I pointed him, I said, look here, here you go. Here's a working uh, thing for DVBS2 encoder and it uses sub modules and it uses this add files and, you know, copy that. Uh, and he copied everything and it looked good to me. He ran it and it failed. It did not work at all. So his his next uh, best uh, attack was to make the channelizer look on the receive side look like an ADI block. That took a lot of work. And he did it and it's now like, okay, so here's how you make it look like an ADI block. Here's how you just become a sheep rather than, you know, like you... you yeah, yeah. Go into the herd. You look like everything else. This is, and if we had access to good documentation, if ADI actually told us all the answers, this would work out well. It's not working out that well. So we now go back to external sub module. You know, we integrate, we cut in, 
but we need yeah. we need a, a really good guide like a good clear you know talk to me like i'm five years old tell me how to do it type of type of uh, documentation and then i think that we could probably get a whole bunch of stuff into these designs i, I don't think that um rewriting the entire reference design is the right answer at this point although that is what terry uh what um you know terry wanted to do uh from one of our systems engineers uh he was like oh just rewrite the entire reference design just take mm -hmm. over just go get the just go get the documentation on the chip and just rewrite it all and i'm like oh, oh that's a mm -hmm. that's a lot of work man <laughs> yeah. that's just, you know okay so yes we could take over everything and rewrite the entire reference design but uh, you know i think that the reference design is good a good start and that we put our ip in it and that's what we that's what we can actually achieve you know rather than spending two or three four years rewriting a reference design for a chip um anyway that's that's the sort of decisions that we have in front of us and if we can get a really good like here's how you do it here's the process of going from zero to putting your your content into the into the reference design as a sub module uh that would that would that would do a lot of good. We could go back to the polyphase filter channelizer and we could try it again and and see and test it that way. We could test it with, with the MSK, could test it with the COBS decoder. And if this turns out to be easier, easier to maintain, that is a huge win, Everest, because as you have found out, like maintenance is a is a huge time time sink. And you don't want to have to keep answering questions and keep doing things, doing chores constantly doing chores you know as a volunteer like you don't want to do that we want it to be as easy to maintain as possible yeah yeah i understand <laughs> yeah i mean because we're we're already we're already motivated to do the right thing like to have beautiful designs and elegant work we're that's what we that gives us the joy right there is very little joy in maintaining code uh th you know where where it's kind of thankless, and then, so if we, if there's anything that we can do at this point to make the job of the designers easier over time, then we should. So I understand the argument for making it look exactly like another ADI block and just moving in, you know. But since we're not really part of the herd, <laughs> we're not really yeah. a sheep. We're really a wolf in sheep's clothing. <laughs> like we're not really part of the herd, so we don't get the benefits. We only get the benefits for a little while until they change something or you know and it moves this is constantly updated code if you go look at their github you can see the activity level um so it's it's sort of ticking type of time bomb for us so i think it's good stuff so it, it, ever east if you could possibly explain how the how this process works so where somebody that doesn't know much about it can do it like they're motivated, they have technical skills, but they don't know how to do it. Like if you could take a stab at writing that, that would be really appreciated. It would really, really help to have a, a guide, you know, uh, a checklist, a guide, a, a walkthrough, doesn't matter. Uh, yeah. That would that would help. Okay. We'll try to do Thank to you. Do that. That's, that's that's very, my... very appreciated. Because I, I, I you know, we, we can see that. the... We can see how just, well it worked with the DVB encoder. That's how the DVB encoder got into the design. And it worked yeah. really well. Just other people that have tried to copy it have had a lot of trouble. You know, competent people, you know, they're not dummies. Um, you know, and they've had they've had a lot of trouble. So I'd like to to reward them for their for their for showing up and, and, and giving it a shot, you know. <laughs> but you should you should ask me. If, uh... <laughs> yeah. As 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 the the the, the, the design with the VS two is working, and if you try to copy for another platform, it doesn't work. Maybe uh, contact me of why why uh, have you done that in this way? And it could be straightforward also. Okay, yeah, that's fair. Yeah. Very good. All right, we're about six minutes over, so uh, we'll close out. Any. Any last comments or uh, any things to uh, to write down so that I need to take care of before next week? Any last thoughts? 
No, I don't have anything else. I think it's a good discussion and, and be definitely worth continuing. Yeah, I agree. I, I really appreciate your, your time and on all of your uh, expertise and willingness to, uh, to do this. Uh, so, so just a, a big thank you from, from, from me, uh, just as the host of the meeting and, and also from all the rest of us at, at ORI. It's really appreciated. Uh, we cannot pull off these very complicated and, uh, these are complicated and complex challenges. This is ambitious work and it all of the effort spent to to figure out all the different parts along the way is really, really appreciated. We we see you and it, in the end, uh, when we deliver good results, it's it's totally worth it. So so thank you. And if you're listening to this and, and you want to get involved, uh, please go to our website. It's openresearch.institute and click the getting started link and that will We'll get you on board and we will meet you where you are. If you're, if you want to get better at this sort of stuff or, or if you know answers to some of the questions we've had, we would really appreciate hearing you. So thanks again and see you next week.